Hello, it's Duncan. The owner of the Gilded Rose has a new story about what she wants our software to do. Unfortunately, it needs a change to our core data, so we're going to have to work out how to migrate from the old to the new. This calls for an expand contract refactoring. We've been speaking with our customer, the owner of the Gilded Rose Magical Goods Store, about her need for a shopping cart. And this led to a realization that we're not really identifying items properly. She says that magical items are more like cars than cartons of milk, which is to say their identity is important. So if we've got three items with the same name, they might have the same quality, they might have the same sell by date, but they are individually different. They might have a serial number, they might have a different color that's not in the name and so on. So what we need to be able to do is track which items are which, and if need be, we can attach a label with a code to an item so we know which one we're talking about in our stock control. So let's just have a look at our stock list and see whether we can see what she's talking about. So this is the app running, and if we look down, we can see oh, there are two Guardian boxes here. They have different sell-by dates, different qualities, but are otherwise indistinguishable. What are the Sulfurous Hand of Ragnaros? is there are two of them with different qualities but otherwise identical um so we can see the problem maybe it would have been nice had we captured this information at the beginning but we haven't and we are where we are so we're going to have to migrate from a stock file that doesn't contain this information to a stock file that does contain this information and we're going to have to invent identifiers somehow so let's have a look and see what we might do in our software Here's our item class. It's a nice simple data class, but data classes compare equals when all their fields are equals. And that means that any two items with the same name, sell by date and quality and type will appear to be the same item as far as our software is concerned. Now, traditionally we add an identifier to solve these sort of problems. Whenever we're going to make a large change to software like this, we need to plan it. This is a migration of data from one form to another. Now we're lucky here that we can take the system down if we need to. It's not a high traffic website. So speaking to the customer, we come up with the following plan. What we're going to do is we are going to find a way to create a new stock file. So stock files are these tab separated files. We're going to take the production version of this. We're going to upgrade it. And then we're going to put the upgraded version into production. So our first problem is to write some code that will create a version of this file with identifiers in it. Let's start by writing a test. Now, the important thing about this migration is it works with the current stock file. So maybe we'll just actually take the contents of that and paste it into here so we have something to work with. We'll put it in a triple quoted string. We'll copy the current version. And we'll put it in there. Now, let's pretend we had a function that would do the migration for us. So we might start with input lines. And that, in this case, will be our stock list, the lines from that. What do we want? We want some output lines that we can write into the new file as we upgrade it. So we might say that that is migrate the input lines. And what do we want it to look like? Well, I'm not entirely sure yet. So maybe we'll just approve the output. We looked at approval test before. We can do that by adding an approver from HTTP 4K. And I think there is this extend with giving it approval test, something like that. And we then want to check that the version is as we approved it, which we won't have done yet. Means we can take our output lines and join them to a string. IntelliJ doesn't know the type of this yet, so we could tell it that we want this to be a list of string. And if we do, then it will create migrate for us. And this is almost production code, so we'll move it out of the test itself. And just down here. And for now, let's just return the input. And run this test. Now what happened? We didn't have an approved output. But we should be able to see in resources, in persistence, what was actually written. And it was, as we expected, the contents of our file in the first place. So let's just approve that. 
And if we run it again, then it will pass because the two files are the same now. Now the migration will be easiest if we convert our lines to items. So in here we could say, let's take our input lines and there was a function on sequence. So we need as sequence and we can get a stock list. Now that is now returned the result type. This isn't production code. So I think we could just say on failure, error of it reason. So that will make our type of items a plain old stock list. Now we can go through our items and add in an ID. This obviously doesn't exist yet. We should probably call this stock list. If we were to do that, then we could then create a new stock list with it, which is our old stock list with the new items. And finally, we can convert the new stock list back to lines and that's a sequence. So we can convert it back to a list. And that would compile if with ID existed. So let's create that as an extension function just for here. And if this was just to return the plain old item at the moment, then nothing would change. We'd have read from the list of strings, we'll have mapped to the same item and then written it back out again. Okay, well that compiles. So let's just check that our assumptions are right. Jolly good. Now we spoke to a customer about what these identifiers should look like. She doesn't want UUIDs or long numbers and that sort of thing. Sometimes items might have a serial number, so we could use that. But where they don't, she says that something like the initials of the name would be fine. So let's put a few of those into our approved file. So there's a tab in here, which I'm just going to grab hold of. So what she'd like is AB1 for aged brie. Amulet of absorbing would be AOA1. Amulet of youth would be AOY1 and so on. We put three in and that will be something to go on with. So it gives a failing test to work towards. Let's run the test. Okay, let's have a look at our error. Well, as expected, we haven't written anything as our ID. In order to write an ID, an item will have to have an ID, and that would be a property. So it's something like val ID. And what should the type be? Well, we could use string or we could use non-blank string. Certainly probably don't want blank IDs. But maybe we should actually create an ID type. Now, eventually all items will have an ID, but at the moment none do. So for now, let's make that a nullable ID so that we can read items that don't have an ID, but we can add an ID to them and write them out again. In here, then our constructor will pass in null when we read, and we need to create an ID type. In a separate file in our domain. What should our class look like? Well, it could be a data class, but we've also discovered we can use these value classes. The value inside an ID, well, that should be non-blank. So we could put a non-blank string inside there and add the annotation. There's one more trick that's worth playing. And that is we can make this a generic class with respect to some type. And then we can accept only ID of item in here. And that will allow us to reuse this ID for other things that might need an ID, but items can only be created with the correct type of ID for them. Okay, let's just see whether anything will compile. And we'll run all the tests now to find out what's going on. Okay, our migrations are still failing. Well, that's our work in progress but also some item tests have started failing. Let's have a look why. And you see the reason is that the two string has changed on items because we've added property. Let's just go and fix that up. We expect this to be ID equals null. 
and another one here. Apart from that, though, it looks like we haven't broken our software. So we could, if we needed to, deploy this production right now. Returning to our migration test, then, this allows us to copy our item, giving it an ID. And we know we've got the name to go on. So let's create that. And this should return an ID of item, not an null one. OK, we wanted initials and a number. So in here, let us return initials from the name plus, say, one for now. What's initials look like? We know it's going to return a string. Well, if we go through our name and split it on space and then take each one of those strings and take the first character out of them, and then join that back to a string with no separator and then uppercase it. That would be a start. Let's try that. And finally, this needs to be an ID. So we want to create an ID from that string. This doesn't exist yet. So let's go and add it to ID in the same way as we had before. So we'll give ourselves a companion object. We will add an operator fun invoke taking a value as a string and we're going to try and get a non-blank string a value if that succeeded we're going to return an id with it inside otherwise null. this needs to know some sort of t and t Remember, the result of this will be nullable. Returning here, that might fail then. We don't want it to fail, but this is code that we are running manually. So we can simply say here, bang, bang, and cope with it when we run it. So let's run it. OK, well, it seems to have succeeded a bit. Let's have a look. But we haven't actually written anything. Now, the problem is here in two line where we are not actually writing the ID. So we may have generated an item with the correct ID, but now we're not writing it out. So we can fix this. We can say this is when this.id, in the case of null, we want the old version. Otherwise, we want a new version we'll fill in after we get it to compile. And the new version will be like the old version but with the ID in first. Okay, let's try running that. Seem to have lost a compile. I think IntelliJ must have put that in for us. Okay, let's have a look. Now we have two problems. Our values are wrong and ID is rendering as not just the string inside it. Let's go back to ID and add a toString, which is going to return the value. Let's try that. And now we seem to have the right characters, but separated with commas. That's a bit irritating. Let's go back to migration tests. And maybe we need to put a blank string in there. Oh, and here we are. That seems to have done a jolly good job. So let's approve that as much better and run our tests to show the approval this works. Good. There is a problem remaining, which is that both of these sulfurous have the same ID. And the point of this was to generate unique IDs for them. So we really need to look at the IDs we've used and create new ones rather than duplicates. Go back to our migration tests. So our strategy is going to be to just keep on adding numbers in, not just the one. So I think maybe we'll make a variable from this and inline this. And now we'll keep on adding numbers. So we'll sit in a loop. Let's assume 100 would be large enough. 
So this is like our candidate ID. And we're going to add in the I there. And we say, have we already used that one? Well, how do we know? Well, we need a set of IDs that we have used. And we're going to ask if the IDs contains the candidate, not, then we can return an item with the candidate. We get out of here, we're in trouble. Again, this code isn't going to be run in production. We're going to run it by hand so we can be a bit more fly with our errors. Okay, here then we need a set of the IDs and for once it's going to be a mutable set. A mutable set of ID of item. I'm going to pass that into here. And we then need to add to the IDs. So we can say in here, bit cheeky, but also IDs add it dot ID. And we know that can't be null, so we can double bang it. Just getting something working at the moment. Let's see whether it does. Our tests have failed, but it might be a good sign because it might mean we've written the right thing. Let's have a look. And here we are. Oh, we've got GB1, Guardian Box 1 and Guardian Box 2, and Sulfurus 1 and Sulfurus 2. Well, that actually seems to meet our spec. So let's approve that and run again. I don't really like the mutating one thing while mapping through another, but the functional purist in me can let that ride. I might just say this is new item. Make this into an expression. Now it would be also nice to know before we run anything or deploy it to production that we can read the output that we would now be writing. Let's add another test. And this is going to be can read new items. So now we're going to read the input lines, we're going to migrate them, and now we're going to read them again. So we're going to say output lines as sequence to stock list. And we'll see whether that succeeds, because if it does, everything's good. This error with it.reason feels like a thing we might pull out into its own little extension at some point. It's going to be red stock. And if we take our red stock and write it out again, we can check that it's the same as the one we read. So we'll take our red stock to lines and join that back to a string. Let's run that. Okay, so this now fails. We're getting this error we're pushing out here. And the reason is because our code can't parse the new items that we've been writing. So let's go and fix that. Where is that? That's in persisting. And we now have two types of items we're writing. One's with an ID and one's without. We can see that here. We're writing different numbers of fields. Now eventually, when we finish this migration, there will only be items with IDs, but it would be nice to cope with both situations for a little while. So what we're going to do, I think, is we're going to pull this code here to its own method, its own function. And this is going to be item without ID from the parts. But we're going to have a different version of this, almost the same. It's going to be item with ID from the parts. Now, in that case, all of these are going to be shifting up one. It's going to be one. It's going to be two. It's going to be three. And we're going to have an ID, which is going to be an ID for our item on the zeroth one. This is going to be blank ID, which we don't yet have. And we'll fill that in here. And now we can put the ID into here. As it happens, we don't have this constructor. So let's go and add ourselves a version of this for now. So this is going to be one that takes an ID and non-nullable in this case. So you can always pass the non-nullable one into here. Okay, now we need to use this. So here we're going to say if our parts size equals three, do that. Else we're going to return item with ID from the parts. Before we tidy that up, let's just run and see whether it works. 
Let's have a look at that file. And so we've successfully read and written and read. So that's our migration. We can approve this and run. Jolly good. We just tidy this up by putting an else in here. Now we can replace this with a when and check that's okay. So if we were to deploy this to production, we'd have code that could read and write both types of items. It wouldn't actually do the upgrading itself. We'd have to do that manually, but we should deploy this code before we upgrade the file by hand so that when we have, the production system can cope with the new version. Before we check in then, let's just write the code that actually does read and write the file. I'll put us a main in here. Read from stock TSV, new stock TSV. So we can take our input, some lines as a sequence from it. We can pass those into our migration. And in fact, just write those lines out to the files. Phew. We'll try running that and see what we get. Have a look in the output file. Well, that looks good. And now for our own confidence, what we'd like to do is we'd like to run up our server against both versions. So we could show that we could upgrade in place. So let's run our main. A new version with a new code. Refresh this. Okay, so we can still read the old version well. Now, let's rename this one to be old stock. Rename this one to be stock. We'll make a change just so we check we're writing the right file and then refresh the browser. Amulet of Youth. This shows that our production code can cope with both versions of the file, so it should be safe to make that change. So what we're going to do now is we're going to deploy the new version of the software to production. We're going to take the stock file, we're going to run it against our main, and then we're going to put the new version of the stock file into our production server. This is called expand contract refactoring. We have to run in production a version of the code that can cope with both items with and without IDs. Once we've upgraded all our items, then we can remove the code with not having an ID, and we'll look at that contract phase in the next episode. If you'd like to see that episode, then please subscribe to the channel. And if you like this content, and in particular want to read more about expand contract refactoring, then you should read the book that I wrote in that price called Java to Kotlin, a refactoring guidebook, details of which are in the show notes below. Thanks for watching.